You're listening to the Inquisitive Red Podcast, the show that brings you philosophical ponderings of your life from a bird's eye view. Now, here's your host, Shah. Hello, welcome to the Inquisitive Rim Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host, and today I'll be interviewing, I mean, this is fantastic, this interview, so I am so pleased. Now, Jane Teresa Anderson is a dream analyst, a dream therapist, a writer living in Hobart, Tanzania. Don't you love that name, Tanzania? It just takes me to all sorts of places. Tanzania, Australia. And she's been researching dreams for almost 30 years. This is fantastic. Now, she's published several books, seven to be exact, on dreams and dreaming. And her latest book, Bird of Paradise, Taming the Unconscious, love the unconscious, to bring your dreams to fruition. And that was in uh, May of 2020 that came out. So James also has several books or several ebooks that can be purchased via her website. She's the creator of this online course, the Dream Academy, another name that's quite magical and mystical. I love it, the Dream Academy, and the host of the very long-running and popular podcast, uh, The Dream Show with Jane Teresa Anderson. So I am so excited to be speaking with her today about her work and her projects. Welcome, Jane Teresa Anderson. Thank you so much, uh, Really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know that you're so uh, used to interviewing other people, So, um, I, but I know that you've done loads of interviews, television, uh, media, all sorts. So today, I really want to delve into your work, but also I'm curious about how you were drawn to working with dreams in particular. So do you mind if we start there? What drew you to working with dreams? my total curiosity and all my dream experiences to start with, you know, ever since a child, I had very vivid dreams and they excited me. I, I was never really scared of my, there were some scary dreams as a child, but they excited me more than they scared me. So I had an inbuilt curiosity. It was probably boring everybody with them all the time as a child. <laughs> had no idea why we had them, what they meant. Was it a separate place we went to? I had no idea, but they just intrigued me. And that intrigue stayed with me, you know, has stayed with me all my life. But I actually went and trained to be a scientist because I thought, for lots of reasons, that was what I wanted to do. And then it was much later in life, some 30 years ago, when I realized there was a particular week where everyone seemed to be telling me about a dream, even though they had no idea that I was really, you know, that it was a passion of mine. And towards the end of that week or two, I thought, you know, I, I really... I have so much passion with this subject. I think that's really where I want to go. And I um, basically dropped everything and um, started researching the subject, got a few hundred people involved in the research, and it all went from there. So to answer your, that's the long answer. The short answer is my passion and curiosity. <laughs> Yes, but that's so important, isn't it? Passion and curiosity. One of the reasons why I started this podcast. It must have been quite intriguing. So it, there's one thing to have those dreams and be intrigued by them, but I suppose there's another thing to actually analyze them. Do you think that most people want to have their dreams analyzed because they're trying to work out something for themselves internally? Or is it more of a um, curious, magical thing? Uh, both. I mean, once people get to know me, they know how I work. And so then they want to work with me because of the methods and the approaches I take. But, you know, there is a third category, which my brother is in. My brother says, I just like to go to bed and enjoy my dreams. I totally and absolutely enjoy the adventures of my dreams. And I would be distressed to learn anything about myself through them. So there's that category of people as well. Um most people will come to me when they know a little bit about my work, and so they then know that uh, that working with dreams with me is finding out more about your inner life and finding out more about yourself, and in so yes. doing, then finding out more about your life. So to me, the magic comes when you understand yourself through your dreams and therefore understand your life, and life is magical itself. So it kind of comes around full circle. People that don't know my work as well will often say, Oh, what is my dream telling me? 
or and, and to me the dream doesn't tell you anything the dream shows you who you are how you think shows you your conscious mindset shows you your unconscious mindset and you can then look into that and go oh is that who i am is that how i think is that how my mindset is now i understand why my life is the way it is and looking at this and understanding this about myself I can now make a decision based on the insights I've got from my dream. I am going to this or I'm going to that. So it's you, the dreamer, that tell you what to do. <laughs> so the dream, you do get guidance from the dreams, but you're the one that does it. It's like looking in the mirror and going, oh, yes, okay, right. Ah, mm, now I know what I'm going to do. Yes, that really does take me a little bit into the precognitive dreams, but I'll, I want to touch on that a bit later. Um, in preparation for this, I kept thinking, what dream books do I have? <laughs> and, um, you know, being a psychologist, most of them are Freud, I'm afraid. Uh, but, you know, there are some Foucault. I had forgotten that Foucault, <laughs> in his book about, um, what's it called? Uh, Care, Care of the Self, of course. Mm -hmm. He talked a bit about the issue of dreams being very akin to Freud, dreams being mostly about the previous couple of days and that that tends to come to the forefront yes. in dreams. I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, absolutely, 100%. And when I did all the research, particularly when I began that research 30 years ago, that was one of the first things I noticed. So what I got people to do was keep a journal, writing down their dreams, and then writing down what was happening for them in the day before, what their emotions were, what issues came up, what thoughts they had. And then I went and compared. And I came to that conclusion then, you know, 30 years ago. That So what our dreams are really doing is processing our conscious and our unconscious experiences of the last one to two days. And we'll come to why it's one to two in a minute. And then comparing that with anything from your past that kind of resonates. So whatever was going on in the last one to two days, if something resonates that from, from your past, then that might come into the dream as well, which might be why you might see people or places or things from the past. And then your mind is doing this kind of um, update. And ideally, in some dreams, not all, but in ideally, your dream will then go, okay, so maybe, maybe I don't believe what I believed in the past anymore. Maybe I've resolved this feeling. Some other dreams go, I discount what happened to me yesterday. I'm going to stick with what I learned from the past. But some dreams then project into the future in the sense of possible futures. So, okay, based on the experiences of the last one to two days and based on reviewing your life, how would you cope tomorrow if this happened or this happened or this happened? So you're kind of trying out possible new futures. And just before I finish there, I want to come back to that one to two days. And the only reason I... It, you would think sensibly, well, we should be able to dream about the last day and then the next night dream about the, you know, why, why one to two days? And the only reason I can come up with that is that sometimes we just have so much going on, so many experiences yes. going on, that sometimes it takes a couple of days to catch up. I see, I see. Yeah, because I wondered about that because it really does go back to Artemidorus when he first wrote the book Interpretation yes. of Dreams. A lot of people think Freud wrote, but Freud just interpreted his book from the second century, you know, AD. So, but he even talked about the issue of there's so much going on in life. And, and there was, especially Freud, when he interpreted it, he talked a lot about uh, the fact that what comes what we remember because i wanted to touch on why do we forget dreams yeah. come you see there's so much to unpack but why we often forget but freud was saying the reason whatever we remember is usually the least significant and i thought oh that's interesting <laughs> why how but when you say the one to two days that makes sense because that's pretty much what's significant and maybe the past I mean, I'm not the dream, app, dream analyst, but I'm just thinking maybe some of the past seeps into that as it connects. Yes, that, that, that's good. Whatever's happened. Yeah. Yeah, whatever's happened. So, so much happens, and our dreams tend to prioritize what is conflicting or what needs healing, what, what is, you know, right. it's not going to go through all the stuff that, yeah, yeah, that was all fine, wasn't it? That was fine, wasn't it? That was, it tends to do the conflicting stuff to try to sort it out, and therefore we'll touch upon conflicts from the past. Or it can also uh, 
do your, your dreams can be um, creative problem solvers, which is the same as conflict. You know, you may it may not be an unhappy conflict, but you may go to bed thinking, oh, what shall I paint tomorrow in my picture? Or what, what am I going to write in the next chapter of my book? Or, you know, give, I, I'm looking for a creative idea. And these are sort of conflicts, aren't they? Because you haven't decided what you're going to paint, what the next chapter. And so dreams are not always working on, like, the, not always working on the dark and difficult side, but anything that needs to be solved or problem or a new way of seeing it, a new perspective. Yes. Okay. But. What you just mentioned, that brings me on to why we forget dreams or why do you think we forget dreams? So why why do we? Upon awakening, it appears that it just floats away. It does, doesn't it? We'll never know, Shah, but I have a feeling that, you know, many hundred years ago, <laughs> we probably didn't forget them. I have that feeling. Um, in, the, in the sense of our brain, our brain is actually structured to forget them. But if we lay there and we bring out a dream and I'll go over some ways to do that and then you sort of catch on to the dream and then you start talking about that dream to people which I imagine people might have done many hundreds of years ago not in such a rush about life then in talking about the dreams you're training your recall and keeping them alive and remembering them so I think there was a lot more remembering in the past one of the reasons we forget our dreams is simply that particularly these days either that we've been told as children oh, don't worry, it's only a bad dream, it's not real, just forget about it, so we do. Or we have a bad dream as an adult, we don't, we don't want to go there, so you lock it down. But also, most commonly, because we jump out of bed, got to get on with life, got to scroll my phone, got to go to work, got to do this, got to do that. And so we don't give ourselves that moment to remember. And in that, we're not giving us our brain or our mind the time to move the ephemeral nature of the dream into solid memory. So that is our task to move it from that dream that would just float away into memory. And so, you know, th there's a sense in which we all need to dream because even people that don't remember their dreams do actually dream. And if you stop people from dreaming, but you allow them to sleep, they get very sick very soon. So we know that even if you don't remember your dreams and work with them, your dreaming is important for you physically, emotionally, um, psychologically, mentally spiritually um remembering them and working with them gives you so much more consciousness around that yes yes i suppose it's just another aspect that helps us to move through life if we can look at what we dream because why would we why would we dream uh yeah yeah so i'm this is the last time i'll mention freud i promise uh listeners <laughs> i freud thought that all dreams even if we forget them they could be brought to the memory through analysis but then he thought everything could be done through analysis so <laughs> yeah it's one of those things <laughs> but i think in a way you it's what you're doing you're through analysis through you know the patient or the client giving you a bit of information then you analyze and that is analysis. So yes. it all works. <laughs> it doesn't. And I, as I was reading a lot of your work, I thought, wow, in the Greek days, you would have been the go-to. You would have been the person, the soothsayer, who everybody went to because the Greeks did. Yes. That's what they did. Yes. And you would have been the one. <laughs> they had the healing temples, you know. You, I'm sure you know about it. The Asclepian. Absolutely. Yeah, with all the snakes, the snakes that yes. you were, fell asleep with all the snakes around you. And then when you woke up in the morning, you told your dream to your dream interpreter, your healer, and it went from there. So yes, I would have been one of those people, wouldn't I? <laughs> yes, yes, and you may have been. You may have already been. Yes, I don't. Well, well, this isn't about past lives, but yes, you may have been. Um, do you believe that creativity uh, is learned or are you born with creativity? Oh, what a fantastic question. I think both. I think, I think we're all born with creativity because our job is to, is to resolve problems and see life differently and learn. And in many ways that, that demands us to be able to shift our perspective and see things differently. And that is creativity, isn't it, in a way? But I'm sure having said that, some people have a, a bigger genetic dose of creativity than others. It's easier for some people to be more creative than others. But I do also believe that we learn it. And I, I know that, you know, we, we can learn tools and techniques um, to be able to become more creative, largely which uh, involves switching off our more analytical brains. 
But certainly talking with people about their dreams, I believe, does um, broaden and deepen creativity because you're talking when you're talking about a dream that you've remembered, you're talking about something surreal, often um, illogical, <laughs> irrational. And so you're in that space and you're there, therefore also in that part of your brain, which is then more open and more open to problem solving and creative and seeing things differently. So I think, you know, working with your dreams, like so many other um, modalities and things that you do in life um, can actually help you to become more creative. And I found in my work, over all these years that the people that come to me and work with it, a lot of people come work with the dream, got what they need, gone off, got a life changing thing happening. Fantastic. Or I won't have that bad dream again. Fantastic. Then other people stay because they just want to come again and again and again. And I found out the people that are very long term clients are often artists who are deepening their skills or they're people who, are, who discover new creativity and go off either full-time or part-time in that direction. So there's definitely a correlation between at least exploring your dreams and and opening your the ways in which you look at life. Yeah. Because I as a writer, you are a creative person, although you're using concrete evidence and things in your books, you're still creating the a story, the way you present it. So that's interesting. And I, I don't know if you thought about this, but as a child, did you, were you writing as a child? <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> I remember. Um, so I know how old I was because I had just started junior school, which in those days meant I would have been seven. And um, in the class, we had to write a story and hand it in. And I must have been writing before that. And I remember being really pleased because when Mr. Reedlinger, the teacher, Mr. Reedlinger, um, came in the next day and said, I want to start with this dream by Jane. Um, and I want to, to read it out because everybody else started their story once upon a time and Jane didn't. <laughs> I think I started with something like, I don't know, some quotes like, oh no, said Mr. Something or something like that. And that gave me encouragement. But I also um, know that about that age, I remember, because I found this recently, I wrote a little book about Danny the elf being found in a flower and all the magical things that he has. And I'd obviously been really pleased with it because I'd illustrated it and stapled it and it got stuck in a book somewhere. And I found it a couple of years ago. So although I don't remember much about it, um, I must have been, because when I think now, I'm a seven's quite young to be wanting to think of a creative start to a story or write a little book. So, yeah, the seeds were there. But, you know, I, I imagine that we were thinking about my family, that we probably weren't um, encouraged to think that writing stories was a particularly sensible thing to do. <laughs> it's not the kind of job that you might end up with. So it was probably like, yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's really nice. Now, let's get on with your schoolwork. <laughs> Yes, but oh my goodness, how interesting, because they do say uh, around that age, I mean, there's lots of research out there, six to eight, we do start to plant our seeds in the direction in which we might go. And if you look at artists, you, you will see a lot of the history. It was around that time that the parents were either trying to help hone their skills or say, no, nope, put that instrument down or no, nope, you're never going to be this or no. Nope. And so if you were encouraged, like you were, really, yes. then it, it helps that seed to grow. So that yeah. is so interesting. That is, I didn't know that about the six and seven year olds. So that is doubly interesting. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, really interesting. Now, um, I, this is it because as I read your work, I was wondering, you've done so much in this field, but you've actually, you're a scientist. You've actually... <laughs> You know, you have degrees in zoology and psychobiology. And I just wondered what sort of, how does it all intercede at this point? It does now <laughs> that I look back and look back through the path. I can see, oh, look, that lead, led to that, led to that. And obviously that's the way to come. Although there were probably many paths. And I was very intrigued with science as a child. I think partly because I think my mum said to me, well, you know, maybe you can go out into the world and find a cure for something. And I thought, oh, that would be hay fever. That'll be, I'll find a cure for hay fever because <laughs> I had bad hay fever. So, <laughs> Me too. Yes, I, thought, yes, yes. I thought science. And then I, I had a situation at school where um, our teachers are so 
responsible for the things that they say. I, a, a science teacher asked a question, I think I was probably about 11 or 12, and a science teacher asked a question to the class. I can still remember what it was, and it's irrelevant. But And I thought, oh, I know the answer to that. I, like, I can just work out the answer to that. I'll tell you what it was. It was um, he said, if you've got a can of Coke and you, you punch a hole in it, you can't pour out the Coke. But if you punch two holes, you can. Does anybody know why that, that is? And I never thought about it before, but I thought, oh, I guess like the air pushes down on one and the coke comes out. So I thought, oh. and later on, he said to me, oh, you're a born scientist. I took that on. Now, was that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know, because it got me where I am. But then maybe I would have got here quicker if I hadn't gone the science route. Who knows? Who knows? But I am grateful that I did for many reasons, partly because I've I've been trained in that analytical thinking and the logical thinking and the breaking it down and the other half of me is very strong so I can balance the two but also because um, yeah my degree was in zoology and I specialized and specialized into the neurobiology side of things so that now that I look back I think well I'm really talking about how our brain and our mind interprets the world around us and that's what I was looking at then how does the brain and mind interpret the the, the um, information coming from the nerves from my senses about the world. So there is some kind of connect there that, that makes a lot of sense. And it does mean that when I write my books, and some of my books are more um, um, artistic in their creative flow than others, others are very sort of sensible how to do this, and others are more met metaphorical. And that's the kind of writing that I really enjoy. But it means that I can still take that structure that I learned in science. I can still take the ho hopefully... Um, rational explanations behind everything into place so there may have been many paths to where I've got but I'm pleased with <laughs> I'm pleased with the one that I that I took <laughs> yes because as you say it is still all interacted because you're also using critical thinking I think in your yes. in your work and that's something that scientists must do uh, and I think I would think to analyze a dream, you have to have some type of critical thinking. Absolutely, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, very interesting path, but we never know. So, what was your first sort of paid job? My first, oh, well, my first paid job. I mean, I had jobs between, you know, when I was a youngster going through schools. So my first paid job was um, working in an engineering factory, printing the factory side of things, printing little micro circuits for Concorde, the aeroplane, which was in development then. So that was like a lucky little thing I got as an experience to be in a lab. Then I went through all the usual um, studenty things like being a cinema usherette and things like that, working yeah. in factories and packing stuff. Um, but my first job job, my first job job was, uh, my first job job was in a, um, a museum. So I'd started a PhD in London at the, um, the, the um, Institute for Medical Research. And after about three months, I thought, you know, I really think I've made a wrong choice here. I don't feel comfortable with it. I don't feel happy with it. There's a lot of vivisection involved, even though they were just goldfish and frogs. I didn't feel comfortable with it. And despite what I'd written on my um, grant application forms, I didn't really, really think that what I was doing was going to help anyone in the long run. It was on brain and nerves and conductivity. Um, so I left there. I left the PhD behind me. And I had this sort of thought in my head that there's something else that I need to do. I don't know what it is, but it's much more grounded. It's community orientated. It's interacting with people. It's helping people understand things. I hadn't made the connection with dreams. And I went back to Glasgow from London, sort of thinking, oh, something will turn up, because I've always sort of thought that. And within a couple of weeks, I was working at a museum, back in my zoology museum, um, sorting out, uh, uh, cataloguing all the dead birds. And I thought, this isn't really exciting either. And after two weeks, I was headhunted to work in a much more exciting section of the museum where, um, to create traveling exhibitions in natural history to help people understand about nature and about the world. And I was put in charge. I was very young and I had to um, work with designers. I had to come up with the idea, you know, complete open slate, complete blank slate. What idea would you like to come up with to put on the road in Scotland? as a traveling exhibition and it was in the days when traveling exhibitions were new so there were all kinds of legal implications as well um you've got a design team to design stuff 
see what you can get the museums to loan you. Not very much because they didn't really weren't used to having their stuff traveling about. And, and here was part of the key, I guess, um, write catalogues to go with it, write material, chat to the media about it, which, of course, has become a very strong um, focus. Everything I've done has involved the media since. And I love that job. And I love the, um, just the, the blank slate and the creative opportunities. So when I look back on that, although I only did it for two years, um, it, it actually gave me a lot of joy. It was very stressful too, because I was very young, gave me a lot of joy and, um, gave me all the basic skills, <laughs> including the just jump in the deep end and just do it that I've needed throughout life. After that, I went and taught for a couple of years because I did along the way squeeze in a postgraduate teacher training degree, thinking back in those days that it was a good thing for a woman to do because wherever you went in the world, you could always teach. We would never do that these days. So I did actually go back and do my two years teaching science in high school to finish, to complete the qualification. So that was my first two jobs. Mm. Amazing. But the correlation the thread is all still there isn't it i'm still teaching different i'm still teaching i'm teaching dreams exactly i've got the, exactly. I've got the writing i've got the bla i've a total blank slate all the time exactly at such a young age and i have to say as you were speaking about that job the energy just rose there and i could i could feel that excitement back then it was amazing so i could see that you were quite happy and also the responsibility you know when you're young you feel good that somebody trusts you <laughs> with that responsibility so that is incredible yeah i would think that that planted some seeds as well for you to to be encouraged to just move on. So, yeah. yeah, but I love it when you said, I just thought I'd squeeze that postgraduate in. <laughs> Some people are crying, <laughs> struggling, tearing their hair out. <laughs> I thought I'd just squeeze that in. <laughs> <laughs> you did it, but yeah, we, we know, don't we? We're either this or we're either that. And it's just one of those things. Some people will never pass a biology course and, and that's fine. Some people can't draw. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, no, no, I can't either. I mean, I can, but you can't make anything out of it. Um, if there were no barriers, I suppose, or constraints, is there a project that you would like to do? Is there something that you've thought about doing? If there's no barriers, no constraints, you didn't need any support, help, funding, anything the, um it would probably still be dream related and it would probably be doing um a tv series or something along those lines so moving in you know and i've got a lot of tv experience but we're moving into something like that but it would be with uh, a big team of people that could do all their you know having people do the, their own professional things that i can't do and so it would be writing that and bringing something like the idea i had for that quite a while ago um and I, I don't know whether it would still be interesting, would be actually uh, <laughs> probably a bit similar to my podcast, going into people's homes and talking to them about their dreams. And then, mm -hmm. it, but that would require probably, it would probably be boring to have the um, TV version of my podcast because they're long and serious. You know, you'd need a lot of, a lot of breakaways and other things happening. So I'd need more creative input, but it would probably be something like that. And it, it's partly because I do actually enjoy... Um, um, communicating and media work and getting stuff out there. But at the basis, it's because I guess I'm, I'm driven for whatever reason to share the, not, not only to share the knowledge I've got, but to show people how to do it for themselves, to show people how to understand their own dreams or to demonstrate how it's done. And I guess that's probably one of the last modalities that I haven't really, you know, all the TV stuff I've all done to date, it's just been like, five minute interviews or a 10 minute segment or something like that, not the actual whole building of a building of a, a thing. Well, yes. I mean, even as you speak about it, I know people would tune in. Uh, maybe there's, you know, it's a different day and age. We often look at TV, but then there's like the YouTube platform yes. and other platforms. So who knows? Yes. Perhaps <laughs> that could, I mean, there's certainly an audience for it yes. hugely. So, uh, now, this is a little bit off focus, and this is how we do it here. What's the best compliment you've ever received? Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's hard. I receive compliments very well these days. I love compliments. So it's not um, it's not that I don't remember them. Um, oh, 
pr- probably the compliments about about my writing when um that that people have enjoyed my write uh, the, the book this isn't a sell <laughs> but the book you last mentioned the bird of paradise when my editor got yeah. to the end she emailed me and said that the your writing and the epilogue is just, I can't remember what she said, but it was just made me feel, oh, that's probably the best compliment I've ever had about my writing. And that made me feel good because obviously, as we can both hear, there's more writing that I need to do. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. That is a beautiful compliment. Yeah. Because writers, you know, it's difficult. You pour your soul out and then, but if your editor said it, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Okay. So, but does your work fit into an industry as such? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> um, so when I feel informed and things, I always put consultant or writer. <laughs> that's that's informal things. That's how um, I can't. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a consultant slash psychotherapist, I guess you could put it along in, in that industry. But then because I also write, because I also do the media teaching communications part of it, I've got I've got a lot of baskets, but they're all part of one big basket. And and it's it's probably a niche that not many people have, so it hasn't really got a label. What label would you put on it? <laughs> yeah, well, you say as consultant, exactly. It's one of the labels I use. Yeah, when you do lots of big, you have lots of strings to your bow, it is mm-hmm. difficult. It's As a spiritual medium, as well as a psychotherapist, it's always been interesting or uh, sometimes a challenge for me to kind of work out how to market myself, especially when you're a member of the British Psychological Society and you're all that. But now things have changed. So I'm quite happy to do that, to let people know. But I wondered with you, uh with dreams i know you talk about how the precognition of dreams and how sometimes people have dreams that may be prophetic that they they may bring to you and say yes it's prophetic and you said that you've actually had yes uh, prophetic dreams i think we all have how can you work out or how do you work out when someone's uh dream is prophetic or when it just is something else yes or is there a difference such a lovely question um and there's no yes no answer to that so (laughs) yeah i've experienced a lot of precognitive dreams about my own life rather than about things happening in the world um with quite a lot of detail and i don't so much now although i do have a sense of things happening and you know apart from my dreams and and when I'm working with people, I can pick up on a lot of things. But in terms of precognitive dreams, I don't have so many now. When I used to have them for about 10 years, <laughs> you're talking about credibility, it was interesting because I was working on ABC radio. Um, I'm talking now at the very early 90s, 1990s. On ABC. So ABC is like BBC in, the, in Britain, ABC radio here. So I was talking about my dream work and had to was do, do talk back, people calling in and listening. And, you know, they knew I was a scientist. And then I, I got a lot of letters from people saying, but I have dreams about the future. How do you, you know, and I've never told anybody, but I'm just telling you because I'm worried that if I told people how they'd feel. And so I, I then had to say, well, actually, I, I do too. So um, why don't we do some research on this? And I mentioned it on ABC Radio, so they luckily embraced it as well. And I got a lot of people uh, volunteer to tell me their stories I did a lot of research. I wrote a book called The Shape of Things to Come, which Random House Australia published in 1998. And so as a result, and (laughs) included in that, I I got my, you're talking about past lives. I got myself, I had this idea that I wanted to be hypnotized, not into my past, but into my future. And, And then see, like just be hypnotized one week ahead, two weeks ahead, and just have it tape recorded between me and the hypnotherapist and see what happens. And then I started to introduce experiments that we would talk about certain things and see if talking about them under hypnosis made them happen. So we got into quite scary territory. So we went in that deep with a lot of lot of the work. But to come out of that and answer your question, and that book is still available as a PDF ebook on my site. Um, what I the conclusion I came to from my own dreams and everybody else's was that dreams that are precognitive. Um, if you also interpret them 
as in meaningful of what's going on for you in your inner world, they are equally valid. You could say, yeah, that's actually is happening in my inner world. So my feeling was that sometimes when our dreams are precognitive, it's because we're not aware of what's happening in our inner world and the thing starts to act out in front of our eyes in the outer world. So because we don't catch it, we see it. And so therefore you're dreaming about it and you're, it, 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 it's instead of, yeah, that energy is going out there and creating. That's the closest I can get. One of the things I did notice talking to everybody was that um, all the precognitive dreams that were really could be verified all happened within two to ten days after the dream. And a lot of those, when I looked at them carefully, were more telepathic than precognitive. So you could say, well, yes, you saw a newspaper headline for two days ahead, but I guess the journalist was already playing with headlines for that. It was already out in the ether in some way. Or somebody died that had been sick. Maybe that energy was already around. So there were very few instances of, like, wham, here's the precognitive event, and there was no lead up to it. So there's also that sense that maybe for some people in their dreams, just as you can work as a psychic, you're picking up some of that while you're dreaming, and it's coming out of the dream. So how I deal with that when people come to me is I'll – say all of that, and then I say, do you mind if we can just forget about the precognitive aspect for the moment and just see how it relates to your inner world? Because there, there is really meaningful insight for you that you can use. And we often just end up doing that. And the person gets so much out of that that they're happy with that because the danger of talking a lot about precognitive dreams to me is that people will then start to think about all their normal dreams about death or their normal dreams about meeting their soulmate are precognitive. And they go off look on that on that chase instead of looking within and getting some valuable and valid insight. It's a huge subject. It's a huge it is. But as you say in your book, The Shape of Things to Come. Uh, now, did you say that's just an e-book now? Yes, or? Um, yeah, because it was printed in 1998 originally. So that's gone out of print now. I think we oh. sold a large number, but it was a long time ago. So oh, okay. it's still available as an ebook, but just from my through my site, my website, yeah. Still sells Excellent. Well, so people are still interested in the subject. Yeah. Absolutely. And I would encourage our listeners as well to go if you're interested in precognitive dreams and a lot of you may be coming here because you've had readings and things like that, please go and get that because that book will explain, as you say, all the research that you've done. Yes. And it does sound really um how do we say brave some of it you were yes. co you were courageous <laughs> to go in there a, a bit about those dreams yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely but interesting so the shape of things to come uh by ebook although i will put all the links i will put everything in the description uh for everybody to listen and to go to so uh you guys can go and get that ebook um, if you could live in any decade, what would it be? It could be past or present, maybe a previous decade you're quite happy with. I love living now, pandemic aside. Um, <laughs> if I could, see, like the fashion part of me would say the 1920s, but who wants to live between two world wars? You know, so it depends what you're thinking. If I'm thinking, what would I like to wear? I'd go the 1920s. <laughs> um are probably, let's say, um, magical Britain, King Arthur, mythical kind of times. Although, of course, the reality probably has been sick and wars and getting killed. But yeah, the, the, uh, the, a, a time of enjoying, um, I guess, talking, um, metaphors, allegories, living a slow life. I, I guess I would pick that. Although I'm, I'm very happy living today. That, that's what that's what springs to mind when you ask the question. <laughs> yes, interesting. But you make such a good point. With every up, there's a down. Yes. And with every happiness, there's a sadness. So, yes, there's all that sort of yin and yang. Yes. But, yes, but interesting. So you like the magical. Jane, you know, when you were talking a little bit about um, your work, I just wonder what skills have you had to learn? Ah. Have you had to I've had to learn so many skills and a lot of them you don't realize you're learning them until you look back. I mean, one big one was podcasting, um, <laughs> but I, I didn't learn it to the extent that you've had to learn it. It was, it was a different setup. So 
um, a friend of mine, uh, my podcast started in 2009. So a friend of mine said, you know, I know you do so much with your dream, what you do, right? You do all these things, but there's this new thing coming out called podcasting. Actually, it's been around for a lot longer, but it's just becoming popular. I think you should do that. I, uh, no, no, that's just too much. I'm not doing that. She kept being persistent. I really think you should do that. You'd be really good. I think I've got so much to do. You know, I don't want to add this extra thing. And then she sent me a link and said, just look, there's all these lovely people that could help you. And one of them was our mutual friend, James, who I didn't know at the time. But I looked at his face and thought, he looks, he looks very friendly and nice. I clicked on it. I liked what I read about him. And then I discovered that he actually... Um, does a lot of website work for a very good friend of mine. So I thought, this is synchronicity, sort of. I'll contact James. And so um, plunged in, and my husband learned all the technical side of it. So I <laughs> – and we just do audio only, so it began then. But I then – so I didn't have to learn the technical side, but I did have to learn, I guess, you know, how I wanted to go about it, what I wanted to for format – uh, I, guess, I think the biggest thing I've had to learn, apart from my actual skills and dreams, is all the IT stuff. Because I had my first website in 1998. When that book, The, the Shape of Things to Come, came out, it was my third book published with a, a traditional publisher. And just before it came out, I, there was this new thing called the Internet, wasn't there, in 1998. And, <laughs> and I thought, I'm never going to go on the Internet because I don't like the sound of that. I really don't like the sound of that. But I might have an email address. And then just as the book was coming out to publication, I thought, maybe, maybe I should have a website. And then people, after they've read The Shape of Things to Come, they can come to the website and I can answer some questions or they can tell me their experiences. So I said to my publisher, Random House, if I had a website address, is there time to, like, put it on the back of the book? And they said, you've got two weeks. So I, had, I didn't know where to start, you know. I mean, these days we all know how to get a website address. So I then had to ask around a few people, how do I get a website address? They showed me. I gave the website address to Random House. They put it on the back of the book. So then I had whatever it was, like two months before the book came out, to get a website up. So, again, I asked other people, how do I put a website up? So it all started like that. And when I put my five-page website up, I thought that was it, like a book. It was finished. Little did I know. And being the early days, I had to learn a lot of um, how to create websites myself. So I had to learn HTML which was huge, HTML language. I don't work that way anymore, but it did turn out to be a valuable skill. So I'd say my biggest um, thing that I had to learn outside of the actual um, dream work has been all the IT stuff that accompanies that. And now, of course, I have lots of people that do the IT stuff for me, but I still like to be able to get into my own website and make my own changes just because that's creative for me as well. I've got Technical people can do the really hard stuff, but I like to get and do the little twiddly bits. <laughs> wow. Amazing. You learned HTML. That Even those letters st strung together frightens me. So <laughs> you, you've done it. Wonderful. But that led us really nicely into your podcast. So your podcast, you started. Uh, and tell us just a little bit about, I mean, you guys can read about it on her website, but can you just give us a snippet of Yes. Of the podcast. When we when started, we did a weekly show, and then I soon became that was a lot. <laughs> so it's now a four weekly show. So we've been we're in our this must be our thirteenth year, or we've done thirteen. We're in our fourteenth year, something like that. And the show comes out every four weeks, and it's an hour show. And basically, it's somebody uh, contacts us and says, "I'd love to be a guest on your show." Um, they only use their first name unless they really, really want to tell everyone who they are. So they're kind of safe because it's just their first name. They're from anywhere in the world. And the only thing I don't know until the moment we press the button to start is I don't know their dream that they're bringing. I have no idea. Sometimes I only know the person's name and where they live. Sometimes they say a bit more like, oh, I live in such and such and I've got three dogs and I've been listening to a show for a while and I'd love to be on. I sometimes know a little bit, but not much more, but I know nothing about the dream. So when you listen to um, an episode of The Dream Show, you'll hear the person tell their dream. And then apparently that's what people like. They like the fact that they're listening to it as I'm listening to it. And then they hear how I approach this dream that I haven't had time to look at. And, they, and so I and the dreamer spend somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour just talking about that one dream. So as a listener, you're um, picking up lots of dream interpretation tips and exploring tips. But people tell me what they love the most 
is where as the the dreamer will begin to tell their story about how the dream relates and you know what's happening in their life and people say they love listening to that um, hearing what's going on for someone else and what resonates with them or what they learn from another person's story. So in a sense, the dream exploration is one thing, but it's also a vehicle for talking to someone quite anonymously about their life. And because mm -hmm. it's anonymous, they go very, very deep, will often be a little cry, and that's okay and it's good. So, um, yeah, that's what, that's what the dream show is about. So, Jane, can you tell us a little bit about the Dream Academy? Yeah, so the Dream Academy is my online learning platform, and I started it in 2017 after many years of training people face-to-face -face or by phone overseas. And I thought, you know, I can make this much easier by putting these courses online that people can go and learn themselves. So I, um, it's been going for four years. There are four courses on it. You start with how to interpret your dreams step-by-step, step, which is, is, is there for people to learn how to do it themselves and you can go through to actually courses on how to become a professional dream therapist as well so the approach is there's videos of me a pre-recorded videos of me and um, charts to download and I take you through filling in the form so you take a dream and you, you I ask questions and show you techniques and you fill in the form as you go with your answers and that leads you to a dream interpretation it was really interesting for me to do because I had to actually stop and think Oh, it's one thing training people by phone or face to face, but actually putting this into a different format really me need, needs me to think differently about this. So I had to think then, you know, how can I convert what I know into charts that help people to understand or things to do, exercises to do. So it was very enjoyable. And um, yeah, we've, we've got students all over the world and they're doing their thing. And once you um, enroll in a course, it's lifetime. There's no hurry or worry. You just take all the time, go at your own pace. And um, yeah, the Dream Academy. So what do they get at the end of it? Do they get a so, little certificate yeah. and can they, they move on to other things? They do. That you get. There are four courses and you get a certificate at the end of each one of them. So the first two courses, there's a test that you do online and provided you pass the test, <laughs> you get the certificate. Um, and the last two courses, the professional ones, you actually work with me as well. And so, um, you know, the first one you you fill in the, in in the the training to be a dream therapist you actually go out and you get volunteer clients and you work with volunteer clients and you fill in a course diary which i then write and then we discuss it and then i give the certificates based on that so it's assignment based so they're very different but the first one which is really you know for people that just want to um just learn the tools themselves that's the that's the that's the place to start go through it get the certificate you can either just sit there and do it yourself or you can say to people hey I've, I've got this course I've done it let me help you understand your dreams because I've got these tools and techniques that I've learned from Jane Teresa amazing but that does lead me into your mentorship is that something else I, I hadn't mentioned a bit oh, yes. uh, so you do a lot of mentoring so can you just I tell do. us a bit about that please? yeah I've got two two avenues of mentoring one is mentoring students at the Dream Academy so often people will do the courses and then say, actually, I'd really also like to be mentored. I'd like to do some extra work with you. And um, people doing the dream therapy course in particular. But I also have another strand of mentoring, which is, <laughs> it began many years ago when people said, I really like what you do and I like the way you help people, but I don't remember my dreams. Can you give me some of that magic? <laughs> so I just... I'm available to talk to people as a traditional mentor, which is when people just want to talk about their life or ask questions or say, this is happening in my life. Have you ever experienced that? What, how would you handle that? So um, sometimes it's people that are writing books, just want someone that's already written a book to help them through. People launching businesses, how did you do it? So just in that traditional mentor, mentor, mentoring role of um, people perceive that there's something that they would like to talk with me about, and I do that so it's their agenda and they get what they need from it. I do bring into that um, my sense of listening to, between the gaps of what they're asking me and then making observations if, if they're invited. If they say, is what I'm saying making sense? I might say, yeah, but do you know that you keep saying this? And so therefore, have you ever thought that? And they go, oh, wow, well, I never knew that. But, oh, that makes so that kind of mentoring. Yeah. So how, if somebody wanted to be mentored by you, how would they go about it? Is it through the Dream Academy or is it just separate? 
it's through my other website through janetheresa.com and it is a fee-based service I'm, I'm, i don't do I, I regard my podcasts and my media stuff as being the the pro bono pro bono contributions absolutely absolutely but yes i mean you know you must you bring uh forward you know a lifetime of experience there so of course it is marketable and valuable so of course people must pay for that time <laughs> and for your time which is valuable um so guys the dream academy and we've also got the mentorship which which is fantastic how do you fit in everything in a day <laughs> i i um i have a cap on how many people i speak to in a day so i even it out um and i also make sure that i um i start early in the morning and i do go to yoga three times a week and that is immutable i go that's it so that's time time to myself um and i have gaps in my schedule to allow for media and things so when media comes up i they have they have to fit in with me <laughs> usually yeah, so that's it just balance all over and i and that's something i've only learned through the years that you can only do so much and that was another motivation for setting up the dream academy i i there's only one of me and not only that but i'm also getting older so you know there may not be one of me for another i don't know who knows so you know there will come a time when i'm not here anymore so i'd like to get as much as my work available for people without actually needing me here Absolutely. so going down that that shoot so yes but there's no mm. doubt you you certainly are leaving a legacy there is no doubt uh, <laughs> but yes just on that bit what else do you enjoy besides your work i um enjoy i enjoy being <laughs> i enjoy being in nature i can easily sit in a chair <laughs> and just be tuned into what's around me. I enjoy that very much. Um, I enjoy going for walks. I enjoy exercising. I enjoy reading, do a lot of reading. And of course, I enjoy being with my family. And I'd say they're probably, they're probably the main things. Wonderful. I enjoy my work. I really enjoy my work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can tell you definitely enjoy your work. Jane, thank you so much for today. It's been absolutely fascinating. I very much appreciate your time. I know you're a busy lady. <laughs> and um, yes, I will put all the links to everything if you want. I would also encourage people to go and try and get, I, I would assume there's a waiting list, but try and get a dream analyzed on the dream show. Thank you, Shah. That's really, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. And yes, there is a waiting list, but you don't get on it unless you get on it. So <laughs> there we go. You have to start, start to start. I may even get on it. So, yes. <laughs> so thank you again. That's been amazing. Have a fantastic evening. Yes, it's evening. Yes, thank you. Yes, <laughs> evening. Have a beautiful day.